Prohibition Partners TV with Lindsay Hooper. Thank you for joining me again for another one of these interviews, all building up to our main event in June, Prohibition Partners Live on the 22nd and 23rd. Hopefully you've got that one in your diary already. So a few more interviews to bring you before the live event. And I'm pleased to say that I'm joined all the way from Toronto by Paul Rosen, who's the former CEO and co-founder of the Kronos Group. Thank you for joining us. What a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Lindsay. It's brilliant to get you on, Paul, and we're really looking forward to getting some insight from you and getting a little snippet as to what to expect at Prohibition Partners. So first of all, can you talk us through what the Kronos Group was about and the connection with the cannabis industry? Sure. Uh, when the company was founded way back in 2012 in Canada, it was at the dawn of Canada's uh, embracing of sensible cannabis reform, where the, our federal government had instituted a commercial cultivation licensing program to really start the conversion of cannabis from an unregulated gray market to a regulated white market. And myself and my co-founder started our company really in pursuit of commercial licenses to cultivate cannabis. And we were an investment company. So rather than starting our own grow, if you will, we started analyzing the group of uh, companies that were seeking licenses. And we started investing directly in a sort of portfolio of what we thought were best in class licensed applicants and several of which became licensed under Health Canada. And that was really the foundation of our company was to take sort of a diversified portfolio approach to invest in a whole range of operators across Canada. And since that time, the company has internationalized and now has assets, uh, cannabis related assets all over the world. Yes, people will have heard of the company that are involved in the industry. And you've been involved in the area for many, many years. So right now, what's your involvement? Yeah, I continue to be full-time uh, entrepreneur and uh, stakeholder in the cannabis industry. So currently what's keeping me super busy in the industry are a few initiatives. I launched a edible company in California last year called Pantry, Pantry Food Co. And we are bringing sort of a wellness spirit to the edible space. I always felt that the edible space wasn't really delivering a high quality product. It was more kind of a candy product with THC included. And so Pantry is bringing sort of a food based approach towards creating delicious, nutritious and psychoactive remedies. I'm involved with another company in California called Global Go, which is a global advisory, not unlike Prohibition Partners, where we have clients from all over the world that are seeking our strategies to either enter the cannabis industry or develop their businesses to scale. I think you're the best placed person here to talk about investment then. Um, what's the profile of people that are investing in the cannabis industry at the moment? Yeah, it's a great question, Lindsay. It's broadening. When I began raising capital for cannabis in 2013, it was a tough sell, let me tell you. I got the side eye from everybody. And the only uh, back then investors that would come in would typically be high net worth individuals that had some personal experience with cannabis and were convinced that it was going to have a transformative effect on the economy. As the industry has sort of validated itself and matured, we're really seeing a broad investor port, uh, profile right now. It can be high net worth individuals, family offices, dedicated funds that have been uh, initiated specifically to invest in cannabis. Uh, we are not yet at the point where we have sort of large financial institutions investing, but we're getting pretty close to sort of a wide cross section of the investment class, really investing in cannabis because of the belief that it's going to have a transformative effect on our economy. And of course, the proof of the assets are going to rise accordingly. There was some poor performance and negativity around the public um, Canadian uh, cannabis companies, um, and that happened for several years. Do you think that had a negative impact on the industry as a whole? I mean, I think it's definitely, it was sort of predictable in that we had uh, almost like a, I wouldn't call it a hysterical reaction, but there was so much enthusiasm around uh, the cannabis industry that definitely 
perhaps for a while valuations got a little bit ahead of where we are on our earnings. And I feel that the pullback that happened in the last painful for stakeholders in the industry, but it's uh, in some ways probably healthy uh, in that the industry at a macro level is continuing to grow quarter upon quarter. At a micro level, we're getting better at starting to analyze individual companies' prospects in the global cannabis economy. There was a period of time, Lindsay, where any company that had the word cannabis in their investment material was really going to get a, a rise on their valuation. And that's very typical for a new nascent industry that's just beginning to scale up and reach maturity. But as we get to a more mature industry, and we can see some analogies to the dot-com, uh, we're getting into a winner or loser mentality where we're not investors are not necessarily going to favor every company simultaneously. They're going to start making quantitative analytical approach decisions and they're going to determine who is really going to be here in the long run. And in the long run, this, you know, the industry has never looked healthier, in my opinion, but in the short term, been some turbulence as some companies, business plans and sort of financial modeling didn't come to fruition when they actually started reporting their results. I'm sure that the projections for 2020 have changed somewhat from the beginning of the year, given what's happened with COVID-19. Have you found that's had um, a big impact? It, you know, it, ha it has and it hasn't. Uh, at, the, the, at the actual street level, the buying and selling, the transaction of cannabis, uh, we're rather resilient and COVID, uh, we're rather resilient to COVID. In other words, what I'm saying is that the consumption or the demand side of cannabis has not slacked off during COVID. Quite the opposite, as people have sheltered at home, we've actually seen probably using data that's pretty real time, that cannabis consumption is going up. And that does not surprise me. It's a stress relief or it's medicinal uh, or people just have more time in the privacy of their own home. So at a, at a actual how is the business of cannabis being affected by COVID, it's been affected positively. There's been some shifts, you know, delivery has taken uh, some market share away from dispensaries, value brands have maybe taken some market share away from so-called luxury brands, but the actual business of cannabis has shown real resilience and health in the face of COVID. On the other hand, to the detriment of the industry, there's been a continuing chill on the introduction of new capital. And because there's been such sort of turbulence and volatility in the broad markets, it's really caused a lot of investors to put their checkbooks away for a while. Our industry does require a lot of capital to grow and to inflate our, our sort of long-term business projections. So the chill on capital is not helping the industry, although the industry itself is doing quite well in terms of reaching its total addressable market. There are new entities popping up all the time as a subsidiary industries. You've talked about medicinal use, but I think the beauty industry is one that a lot of people are interested in at the moment. Definitely. I know Prohibition wrote a pretty transformative paper a few months ago about just the size of what the cosmetics industry, uh, the cosmetic slash cannabis industry will be. And no doubt that's the case. We're seeing a real call to action for alternative ways of uh, digesting or consuming cannabis. And what we're really seeing now is a shift, a gradual shift, but inevitably a shift away from uh, lung based consumption, which is like smoking and vaping towards either oral, i.e. edibles, or topical, i.e. cosmetics. And it makes sense. It's different ways for cannabinoids to be absorbed in the system. When you use a topical, it's going to go through your lymphatic system, which is doesn't create much hazard to your body and is really quite bioavailable. And when you consume it orally through an edible, it's going to go through your liver, which again doesn't tax your lungs. So I do see that the cosmetics industry is going to have a huge lift through the introduction of cannabinoids. We're already getting some strong proof of concept. We're seeing large cosmetics retailers like Sephora really lean into the CBD space as this unique ingredient to be used in skincare formulations. I'm sure everyone's going to be interested to hear more about that on the 22nd and 23rd of June. Um, I suppose as well, alongside you, you're talking about all these other um, investments opportunities. If you are looking to invest um, and deploying capital, what should you be looking for? Um, 
you know, you really got to go through your checklist uh, to make sure that you're investing in the right company, in the right asset class, in the right jurisdiction at the right time. And by that, I mean, you can see sort of an evolution when new countries come online. So Canada started its meta in 2013 and then its recreational cannabis program a few years later, you know, we had a supply shortage and that supply shortage stayed for quite a few years. And at that point, the greatest asset class to invest in in Canada was cultivation. But fast forward to 2020, just being a pure cultivator isn't as compelling as it used to be as we've reached a point of equilibrium between supply and demand. So ultimately, I tell all investors, you've got to understand in the jurisdiction that you're investing in, what's the relationship between supply and demand. And as long as there's a supply shortage, which there often is when new jurisdictions come online, uh, you're probably very well placed to invest in cultivation assets. But as the industry matures and supply increases to meet demand, then you're looking to upstream your investment from cultivation towards brand or distribution. And as you worked your way up the ladder, what was the most important? No. Sorry. Yeah. You carry on. There's a delay there, so you carry on. No, no I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a... I, I was going to say, and then, of course, you got to really look at each individual company to really make sure that they, their management team is staffed with, you know, best in class uh, professionals uh, representing all the different skill sets. Because even if you invest in the right asset class in the right jurisdiction at the right time, it really is going to come down to the people running the company. And that's kind of a basic thing to say, but these fundamentals never really go out of fashion for investors is not only uh, do you want to make sure that everything at a macro level lines up, but that a micro level, the team is really up to the challenge. Is there a danger of the market becoming flooded and people being too late to come on board? There's always a risk for any individual investor when they're investing in one or two companies uh, that those companies may be short-sighted and not really able to gain the necessary traction and market share that they will require to become profitable. One thing I really encourage investors that are sort of new to the industry or interested uh, is to consider investing through a fund that has years of experience analyzing cannabis companies and the sort of the cannabis infrastructure and th this value of what I call context cannot be understated. You know, I myself either have started or invested in really well over a hundred cannabis companies and have inbound uh, as a prospective investor, the business plans of well over a thousand companies. And by having so much context and exposure, it really creates for me a proper methodology to be able to say why I might like why I might like one company more than another. But lacking that context, uh, it's easy to get seduced by sort of the macro business uh, plan of any one company. So I really tell people like any industry if you're not yourself an expert it's worth paying the management fees to go to a fund that is an expert until you feel that you're sufficiently confident in your own methodology and your own information to be able to start analyzing both quantitatively and qualitatively why one company is going to perform better than the other one in the long term and it really is a long term thing you know that expression that the market is um, uh, a voting machine in the short term and a weighing a weighing machine in the long term and so in the short term you can sort of get um, a little bit uh, starstruck by sort of the popularity of a company, but in the long term, what you're really trying to value is how are they going to create positive earnings and are they going to be sort of a flash in the pan hot story that took advantage of the hype around in the industry, or are they going to be a long term constituent that's able to ride the ups and the downs, but by having a dedicated fundamental approach that emphasizes core business principles that that company will survive regardless of market turbulence. That is some great advice. And thank you very much for taking the time to share that with us. And we look forward to seeing you in June. Thank you very much, Paul Rosen. My pleasure. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for your time. And if you're an investor or a want to be investor in the cannabis industry, there'll be more speakers just like Paul at the conference. Prohibitionpartners.live is the website to go there to book tickets for the 22nd and 23rd of June. And we'll see you there. Be 
part of the conversation at Prohibition Partners Live, 22nd to 23rd of June, the premium online cannabis industry conference.